Hi, I'm Kathleen Clausen, the artistic director of Your Date and Opera. Thanks for joining me for Coffee with Kathleen. In anticipation of our upcoming world premiere of Finding Right by Laura Kaminsky and Andrea Fellows Feinberg, today will be a two part conversation extracted from a recent presentation for the Opera Guild of Dayton. First, I'll talk with Harry Haskell, author of Maiden Flight, the true life story of Catherine Wright, who is one of our opera's main characters. And then I'll speak with the librettist Andrea Fellows Feinberg about the genesis of the opera. Thanks for joining me. Uh, well, I'll try to be uh, as brief and uh, informative as I can be. This is a project which has been gestating for many, many years. Uh, uh, it's uh, something that uh, growing up in the Haskell household, I was uh, a story I was very much aware of. I didn't know my grandfather. He died a couple of years before I was born. Uh, but my father uh, knew Catherine and uh, was present at their wedding and had stories to tell, which he would share from time to time. We also had a wonderful cache of Catherine's love letters to grandfather, uh, written over a period of about two and a half years after my grandmother's death in 1923. And these were kept in a, um, on a shelf in the library. And uh, my older sisters, I have four older sisters, so I'm kind of the flip side of the Wright family. Catherine was the youngest girl in a family of boys, and I'm the youngest boy in a family of girls. And all my sisters uh, assured me that I would never have any interest in these letters because they were just pure mush. <laughs> they were just romantic as, as can be. And so I, uh, I, I resisted the temptation to look at them until long after my dad was dead. And indeed, uh, uh, it wasn't until my mother uh, loaned the letters to our local university in Kansas City for microfilming uh, uh, that uh, I started to take a look at them and become interested in Catherine's story uh, and began thinking of myself as at least an adjunct member of the Wright family. And uh, like most people, I had grown up knowing what you know about Wilbur and Orville Wright. And like most people, I had never heard of Catherine Wright, uh, ex as you know, except in any other connection, except uh, from my family. So uh, all of this began percolating and I uh, had an opportunity to write another book uh, in the early aughts, uh, the early 2000s about my grandfather. And it was about the newspaper he was the editor of, the Kansas City Star. And there were some issues that arose in telling that story which I discovered to my great surprise, Catherine's letters uh, were a wonderful mine of information about. And so I started reading them. They're about, I should say 2000 pages. And they're, I, I brought some here just to, I'll just hold one up in case you haven't seen. Let's see, am I getting, is this anything you all can see? Yes, yes. Yeah. That, uh, an example just picked at random of Catherine's amazingly precise handwriting. And um, she wrote, of course, before she started corresponding with my grandfather in earnest after my grandmother's death, uh, they had been at Oberlin together in the 1890s and they had corresponded uh, over the years periodically and certainly stayed in touch. Um, but uh, so Catherine, if you go on the Library of Congress website, you can see uh, scans of hundreds of Catherine's letters uh, there, uh, along with Wilbur and Orville's letters and other family documents. Um, another major repository is right there in Dayton at Wright State University, uh, which has lots of Catherine's material. So all of these things came on my radar and I began looking in greater depth at Catherine and her, her letters that she had written over the years. And she began to emerge as a person in her own right. <laughs> uh, somebody who was not just her brother's sidekick and her, her brother's helper, and certainly not just my grandfather's uh, wife, second wife. 
uh, but a very considerable uh, woman who, whose experience of the world and whose um, position in history on the cusp between the Victorian era and the modern era uh, became uh, a source of fascination for me as I know it did for Andrea and has for other people who have looked into her life. Uh, and the great thing about anybody who's interested in Catherine is you don't have to look very far to find out what she was feeling, what she was thinking. She puts it out there right in the open in her letters. And they are the most amazing letters. I think I've, I've had people tell me that these are among the, uh, the, the most significant and most revealing body of, of letters uh, in, in all of history, really all of Western history, uh, because she was not only a woman of consequence uh, and from a very important family, an iconic American family. She was a woman who was very much in touch with her feelings. She was highly intellectual. She was literary in the sense that she wrote fluently with amazing uh, grace and ease. Uh, and sometimes she would write uh, in, the, in the manner of the time, she might write five or six letters a day. And these weren't quick notes. These were letters of four or five pages. Uh, by the time she uh, was, my grandfather was courting her in the mid 1920s, uh, she would sit down at her desk at Hawthorne Hill, which I'm sure many of you have visited. And perhaps you've seen her desk in the, uh, in the little room overlooking the front door. Uh, the front gable in, in um, or the front uh, porch in Hawthorne Hill. And that's where she would sit until late at night often, writing these letters to grandfather. Uh, and it was as if she had a direct line from her, from her brain and her heart to her hand. It just flowed out. There are no scratchings out, no erasures, no evidence of second thoughts in these letters. Uh, she used a typewriter very occasionally. Orville had bought her at least one early on and then replaced it, I remember, in 1924 with a Remington. And she considered this a great boon, although she was a little reluctant, as many people making technological transitions are, uh, that this would uh, stifle her, her uh, expressiveness. Uh, but she overcame that. And uh, of the as I say, roughly 2,000 pages of letters that I have uh, in this body of correspondence to grandfather, uh, I would say not more than, oh, 15 or 20 of them, uh, the letters are typed. So she really preferred to handwrite. And uh, of course, you see with people's handwriting uh, a great deal of their character. And uh, I like to think that uh, because we don't have any recordings of Catherine's voice, she died in 1929. She could have been recorded. She could easily have been recorded, as could Orville. Uh, but they, uh, Orville, actually, there are two very brief recordings of Orville's voice. So we have an idea of what he sounded like. But for Catherine, nothing. And uh, for my grandfather, I have one recording of his voice made in a promotional film uh, for the Kansas City Star, the year Catherine died, 1929. Uh, so uh, part of my attempt in telling the story of her relationship with grandfather was try to recreate their voices. There are three characters in the book, Orville, Catherine, and Harry, my grandfather. His real name was Henry as my real name is Henry, but alternate generations in our family uh, are called Harry to avoid confusion for some reason. Somebody thought that was a good idea about four generations ago. I do not have a son, so I will not be <laughs> inflicting that on, on him. Uh, but uh, it became a, a, a passion of mine to try to literally hear their voices. And this is something I've talked to Andrea and, uh, uh, and Laura Kaminsky about, uh, because they've gone about recreating the voices of these historical figures in a very different way. Uh, for me, it was based, because I'm a writer, it was based very largely on what I could read and what I could read between the lines. 
And so in putting together this narrative, which I call Maiden Flight, uh, because it was Catherine's first marriage, it was not her first relationship with a man, but it was her first serious long-term relationship, which she entered at uh, the mature age of 52. My grandfather was a similar age. Uh, in, in, uh, in trying to recreate their voices, um, I, I realized that the letters uh, would tell the story. They would tell her side of the story and occasionally they would uh, reflect on what grandfather or Orville had, had spoken, had told her. So they were very valuable in giving an overall sense of context. But it was hard for me to see how somebody just reading them uh, would be able to see the three-dimensionality three of this relationship, uh, almost a menage a trois, if you will, because uh, as some of you know, at the time that uh, Catherine and my grandfather became uh, intimately acquainted in the early 20s, Catherine was still living at Hawthorne Hill alone with Orville. And it was a very close, intense relationship. I had gotten a lot closer after Wilbur died in 1912. And many people, in fact, who visited them and didn't know any better, uh, thought that they were man and wife. Uh, and this is a, uh, a relationship that Orville uh, relied on uh, very, very, uh, very strongly. Uh, there was a, a strong dependence on Catherine uh, especially in the years after Wilbur died and shortly thereafter, uh, Orville wound down the affairs of the Wright Company, eventually sold it. And uh, then he became the, uh, you know, the grand old man of American aviation. He was free to, he didn't need to work. Uh, so he was free to uh, sit on corporate boards, to sit on committees in Washington, to be on call for various uh, advisory uh, roles, and to tinker, uh, which is something he always loved to do. So he spent long days in his workshop, not always working on aviation projects, by the way. There were other things that Orville made, toys for the family as a, uh, a, a, among them. And uh, so th this relationship with Catherine, which was very smooth and steady, was clearly disrupted when my grandfather came back on the scene in a major way and began to press his suit, as I, as I like to think of it, in uh, uh, largely by letter. Uh, we don't have his side of the correspondence, it has disappeared, but Catherine's uh, letters, uh, you know, uh, start uh, by, expressing great, uh, great support and condolences for the uh, loss of his wife, Isabel, whom Catherine had also known. Uh, and uh, then gradually they morph into something different. And uh, there's a, a line that is always stuck in my, in my mind that Catherine said, and this is after my grandfather has effectively popped the question to her, to her great surprise, uh, she said, well, it now occurs to me that we are past the hazards of friendship and we now have to deal with the hazards of love. And it is that experience of dealing with the hazards of love, Catherine's attempt to uh, disentangle herself emotionally from, uh, from her relationship with Orville and devote herself to this totally unexpected relationship with my grandfather uh, that is the subject of the book, which is told as a series of interlocking recreated memoirs of the three characters uh, drawn in Catherine's case, almost exclusively verbatim from her letters with some infilling on my part where it was necessary to uh, to stitch things together. I had a fair amount of uh, material to work with from my grandfather, but very little to work with from Orville. He, uh, as so often to so many people, although he was a very, uh, very public man and a very, uh, very personable man, a fun-loving man to the family, 
in in uh, in public he often came across as uh, you know tight lipped and he was a man of few words and uh, so I took the liberty of creating a few for him which I hope uh, give some semblance of what we know his his actual voice and mode of expression sounds like. A huge thank you to Harry Haskell for joining us today. It was so great to learn more about Catherine. Now, stay tuned for part two, our conversation with Andrea Fellows-Feinberg, the librettist for Finding Right. <laughs>